Welcome to the podcast that will teach you how to successfully invest in and build steady streams of passive income from the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Veteran real estate investors Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart from Mobile Home Park Academy will personally share with you the valuable lessons they've learned along their journey as mobile home park investors so that you too can learn how to build massive cash flow and huge profits from this extremely lucrative niche. So without further ado, let's welcome your hosts for today's show, Kevin Bupp and Charles Dehart. Welcome guys and gals to the Mobile Home Park Academy's weekly podcast. We'll provide all the information that you need to know to successfully locate, negotiate, close on, and make huge profits from the lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. I'm your host, Kevin Bupp, and um, we're actually rolling solo today. I don't ha- do not have Charles here. He is busy making deals happen. So, uh, But I'm not alone today. Today, I have a guest for you guys. Uh, we're going to be sharing the stage with real estate investor and mobile home park owner-operator, Rich Ferradino. And Rich has been active in the mobile home park business for just a little over a year now. And um, here's the part that is so that I find so interesting about Rich and uh, his involvement in the park business is that he loves park-owned rental trailers. Now, if you guys have been listening to my stuff for any reasonable period of time, then you probably already know that um, I I kind of dislike rental units. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just a different business model. But you know, we do everything in our power to sell them off as soon as possible upon purchasing a mobile home park. Well, there are many others, not just Rich, but many others who disagree with with my business model of going to all lot renters and they prefer the rental method. So in today's show, we're going to dig deep and find out all the good, the bad, and the ugly directly from someone who lives and breathes park-owned homes on a daily basis. But before we introduce Rich to the show, I'd like to run through just a real quick a couple of housekeeping items here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, for those that don't know, we have a training program called the Mobile Home Park Academy. It's it's live and uh, it's there waiting for those that have an interest in learning how to invest in this lucrative, lucrative business of mobile home park. So it's a 90-day intensive program and uh, is by far the most in-depth training and coaching that you'll find in this niche. And you can learn more about that by going to mobilehomeparkacademy.com. Uh, also, we just recently opened up our Mobile Home Park Investment Partnership Fund. And so we're looking for investors just like you who have an interest in partnering with me and Charles and the rest of our team on mobile home park deals. And you can read more about our company and the opportunity to work together by visiting our main company website, which is sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. Again, sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. And I would absolutely love the opportunity to show you why Charles and I think that mobile home parks are one of the best kept secrets. And uh, we show you proof of how they outperform, always outperform, almost always outperform just about every other type of real estate investment that you've ever seen or heard of, okay? Um, So again, to learn more about that opportunity, go to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. And uh, for those that have an interest in partnering together, if you decide to invest with us alongside us in this partnership fund, um, Charles and I, we decided uh, a couple months ago, we've decided that anyone who invests with us is going to get free lifetime access to the Mobile Home Park Academy, okay, to our 90-day intensive training program. It's not just 90 days. It goes on for basically ever. So there's weekly coaching calls. There's live deal reviews with Charles and myself. Basically, you have us as a coach to help you become successful in this business. So maybe have an interest in passively investing with us in our partnership fund, but maybe also want to understand the mechanics of the business so that you can go out one day and buy your own mobile home park. Well, you have the ability to do that. And like I said, we'll give you free lifetime access to the Mobile Home Park Academy if you invest with us in our partnership fund. So again, to learn more about that opportunity, go to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. And uh, just a couple more things here real quick. If you ever find yourself in the Tampa Bay area, that's where Charles and I are based out of. So we'd love to meet up with you. You know, we love meeting others that share the same passion for the mobile home park space. Okay. Shoot us an email. Uh, um, um, I'm sorry. It's uh, mobilehomeparkacademy at gmail.com. That is an email that comes to Charles and myself. Again, mobilehomeparkacademy at gmail.com. And just let us know what your travel plans are. And uh, we'll try to coordinate a time to get together while you're in town. And lastly, guys, um, this is more of a casting call than anything else. So, this is basically the reason why we have Rich on the show today. I mean, he's a mobile mobile home park operator. He's active in the business. And I feel like we all learn so much from others that are actively in the trenches that are working this business day in and day out. And so we would love to have more riches on the show. So if you're someone that's listening in and you own mobile home parks, you're active in this business, we love to have you as a guest so that you can share your story. We all learn so much from other stories. And I'd love to have you as a guest. So if you have an interest in learning more about being a guest on the show, 
I can send us an email to mobilehomeparkacademy at gmail.com. But uh, I think that's all. So let's uh, let's get on to the show with Rich. Uh, Rich, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Kevin? Oh, I'm, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking. And uh, just to give a sense of geography, where are you based out of, Rich? Where are we calling you at today? I'm going all the way down to down south to San Antonio, Texas. All right. Good deal. Good deal. And so, Rich, what I'd like you to do, um, for those that don't know who you are, what you're all about, take a few minutes and tell us a little bit more about Rich and your background and um, you know how you got into this this crazy business of, of mobile home parks. Yeah, sure. So uh, I originally started getting into real estate, uh, just pretty much house hacking. So I'd buy foreclosures and live in them and then rent them out after I'd move into another house. And I wanted to, I saw, I wanted to grow my business and be more scalable. So I looked at multifamily, but in the San Antonio area, it's, um, you have really low cap rates and um, you need quite a bit of equity and a lot of capital to do those deals. Uh, so um, one of my roommates prior to coming to San Antonio, um, he uh, just uh, was a mobile home dealer, but mostly just focused on repos. So uh, repo mobile homes. So I invested with him for a couple of years. And so I was pretty comfortable with mobile homes. So I thought about maybe just doing mobile home parks because I like the advantage of a lot of these people are older and they want to sell the parks. So owner financing was very attractive to me to get into the marketplace. Um, and then as well as just um, being able to scale on that model. And uh, that's kind of how I got into it, just wanting to be able to scale my business into more properties in one parceled area and, and grow from there. Okay. So when you decided that you, you know, that you, you kind of thought you might want to go buy a mobile home park, what did, what did you do? I mean, how'd you find it? I know you own two today, but um, what'd you do to go about start finding opportunities out in your marketplace? Uh, mostly I just looked on the MLS and LoopNet. Obviously that's probably not the best way to go about and finding the best of deals, but um, I'm one of those people that likes to learn from experience. Like you could tell me a hundred times on how to do something, but until I actually do it, and learn my lessons. That's kind of the, how I learned it best. <laughs> so um, the first deal I bought was uh, just ten units. That was yeah, ten units. So it was a hundred, uh, two hundred thousand dollars and thirty thousand down, and um, it was uh, half occupied, but had all the mobile homes on there. And I really didn't see a way for me to really lose money because um, just the, the way the, the node and the expenses was way lower than what it was currently operating at. Mm-hmm. So I just. Like just jumped in with my feet wet, and you know, I really didn't see a, a huge risk there, just because the market was hot, and um, I was able to get all my homes rented in the first two months. So I was cash flowing on day one, and just continued to increase the cash flow. Okay, so that was your first park, Ten Space Park, that is in San San Antonio. That one's um just south of San Antonio in the city of Floresville. Okay, it's, uh, it's in the metro area, it's about twenty five to thirty minutes south of San Antonio. Okay, so you found this deal on uh, LoopNet or MLS, is that correct? Mm-hmm. One of those two? Yes, okay. Uh-huh. And um, you saw an opportunity there. There was uh, 10 spaces, uh, 10 homes in that park, but only uh, five were occupied. The other five were vacant, I'm assuming park-owned homes. And so talk to me about yeah. the, the rest of the park. I mean, is it all 100% park-owned homes? Well, right now there's uh, nine park-owned homes and then one lot renter. Uh, the lot, lot renter is paying... Uh, 375 a month, and then the three bedroom mobile homes in that area in the park are paying uh, 850. Wow! But we are including the we're, we are including the water and water sewer and trash. Um, so the water is probably about 40 to 50 bucks a pad, and the trash is 218 dollars for the entire park. So I guess you're saying about 75 dollars uh, for expenses plus whatever. Uh, repairs and taxes and insurance that are needed on the park. Mm-hmm. But um, that's kind of like why I like the San Antonio area for park owned rentals because if you get into some other states, the lot rent will maybe be 200 and then maybe a, a rental will be maybe 400. So I really don't see a huge bump in the amount of risk that you would take to rent a mobile home if there's such that small amount of margin between lot rent and um, park owned rentals. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, that absolutely makes sense. And so, City Utilities, I'm guessing? City Water, City Sewer? It has, um, that one's on Septic Tank, but uh, City Water. Okay. Do you do you, uh, do you uh, plan on actually submetering that water back at some point in time in the future? Or? Yeah, that's, uh, that's I think that's the best way uh, to go about minimizing your expenses because of everything I've read and talked to other park-owned um, park mobile home owners and 
they've seen a big drastic reduction in their water bill once they start billing back the water. Uh, so that's definitely in our business plan sometime doing that this year is to start billing back the water and can, the trash. Yeah, I can tell you that we, on average, see between anywhere on the low end of like 25% on the high end of like 40% uh, drop mm-hmm. in water usage when we when we submeter right. it back. Uh, probably the most recent case is a park that we own in Alabama where we it's been, I guess, probably four months now since we submetered it. And uh, that one uh, was about 40, 41%. I mean, just a huge, huge number um, of, of savings. And so it just, it made sense for us to get that done right away. But we always, that, that's kind of one of our initial uh, strategies going into park is if it's not submetered, we do it ASAP. And so, because we want to start reducing that water. So even if they're, you know, even if the residents are paying it already, like, if, you know, a lot of parks we buy, they might be on some type of rub system um, to where they're still getting billed for the usage. Um, it's just, it's, I think it's our job and our duty to basically protect, you know, protect from waste and, and, you know, this, this water just running down the drain, right? I mean, we only have so much water. It's not a, it's not necessarily a resource that's going to be around forever. So, um, we need to do our best to conserve it. And, um, but either way, right. so and a lot of, go ahead. Yeah. A lot of the technology, a lot of the technology they have now, they use, um, like 3g, like a phone signal and they can notify you if there's like a water, yep. like an increase in water usage over a certain amount of time. So just for being able to identify water leaks, very quickly will save you hundreds of dollars. Too. Yeah, we're actually we're we're going to be converting. We're testing out a few different systems here in the next couple of per, uh, parks that we purchase, and so we're probably going to be going away if, if it all goes as planned, going away from um, our our typical analog meters that we install to where our uh-huh. manager would go around and read them each and every month and, and switch over uh, to a company that's got digital meters that has a lot uh, better technology to where, like you'd mentioned, they've got a you know a 3G signal, basically a cell phone signal in the park, and uh, you've got a dashboard you can log into and, and see your water usage in real time and get notified when a leak's occurring, you know, which is pretty amazing, pretty amazing technology that's available. So we are planning to go to that um, for this next, literally the next park we purchase. That's exactly what we're going to be doing. So looking forward to that because I think that will save us a lot of money in the long run and uh, just minimize our, I guess, our, 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 you know, active management that's necessary in the park. You know, the, the one challenge that we have with doing that um, is, you know, it's, it's the manager's responsibility. In all of our parks, it's their responsibility to take regular walks around the entire community and just keep an eye out, right? I mean, look, you know, walk behind homes, walk around them, just keep an eye out for, for leaks, keep an eye out for people that are breaking rules, that have trash laying outside, that have a dog that shouldn't have a dog. But I can tell you that most of the time the managers don't do that. And so in our exactly. mind, you know, with reading the meters, that forces them. They have no other option other than to walk around the entire park at least once a month because they have to read the meters. So <laughs> there was always a benefit that we saw in having them physically go out and read the meters. Um, and so we'll have to figure out how to get them off their butts and <laughs> get out and physically walk around the park if they're not reading meters. So. Yeah, maybe it's doing maybe monthly videos or something. <laughs> yeah, we do that. We do that, but that doesn't go behind the home. I mean, you know, there's a lot that you can learn when you actually are walking the entire grounds, not just up and down the road, you know. So we do have them do drive throughs. We have them put the camera on the roof and you'll take videos of the park from basically from the street view. But there's a lot that can happen behind that, you know, that's not visible from the street view. And so we just really exactly. like to keep an eye on what's going on around the park, not necessarily just what you can see from the street itself driving around the the community. So, so talk to me about um, the financing side of it. So you got this owner to finance, give me an idea of number one, why he was willing to finance. And then number two, what kind of terms you got? Right. So it was an older lady. So I think she was just trying to get rid of it. And there wasn't a lot of movement um, on a property for sale. Uh, So um, she was like in her eighties. So uh, we did, um, it was for sale for two hundred thousand. We did thirty thousand down, and then six uh, percent interest for fifteen years. So, oh, um, so fully, like, fully amortizing, like, no balloon. Right. Exactly. Okay, that's fantastic. That's great financing. And so, give me mm-hmm. an idea of like cash on cash returns. I mean, assuming that you know, once you got the park stabilized, which sounds like it only took you a few months to get it stabilized. Um, what are your 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 real cash on cash returns factoring in repairs and maintenance and reserves and everything else that goes along, goes along with running a park? Uh, I don't have the exact number, but I know it's over twenty percent for sure, mm-hmm. probably like twenty five percent. Okay, uh, cash on cash return. And then there was five down units in this park. Give me an idea of like how you took on those five down units. I mean, did you repair them yourself? Do you have uh, an on site handy person that helped you renovate those? Give me an idea of how you basically got them 
up and running? And then do you have an on-site manager that helps you with leasing them or, or selling them off? Uh, you know, get, I guess really, really, how are you running the park today? I guess is a better question. Yeah, yeah sure. So um, one thing to know is I do have a business partner in, um, on all my mobile home park deals, and he is um, he sells like I was saying, uh, repossessed mobile homes. So he has uh, a lady that does collections. He has probably like four or five repair crews, and then he has uh, a lady that shows the mobile homes. So I use a lot of his current business operations to run these parks. So um, pretty much literally what we did, we just did a, a checklist on uh, all the, um, all on the, all on all the, on, all, on all the vacant mobile homes mm-hmm. and just had his repair crews go out there, fix everything. And then um, I would just pretty much put them on uh, Zillow and Craigslist. And then I would ship those um, interested candidates over to the, a pretty much a mobile home park shower she would show off the homes, uh, collect the applications, and then give me the leases and the applications. I would qualify the actual tenant, and then um, we would sign the documents, and I had to give it to my collections ladies to make sure that they're paying their rent on a, month, on a monthly basis. Mm-hmm. But they would be for 12-month leases. So I, since I do have a full-time job, I can't be involved on everything. So kind of like how you do, uh, you use like Upwork to pretty much have a – person do a lot of your grunt work pretty much so i, I try to um just delegate as much of the tax tasks that i can so i could focus on uh growing the business and doing the fun parts that i like um, mm-hmm. in mobile home park okay what on, on average what are you spending on uh like the renovations like these five empty homes that were there um in, number one give us like a, an average age and uh and size of home but then also you know average spend on actually getting it ready for move in Sure. Uh, so these homes are probably 1990s, uh, three bedrooms. Uh, there's maybe one or two, two bedrooms. And it cost anywhere from, I would say a good three to 5,000, depending on what was needed. Our biggest expense in the park right now is probably, uh, the water. So definitely that's kind of like one reason why we definitely want to get the water meters installed and filling back. Um, it's either the tents just don't even tell us about the water leak until we get a big water bill. So um, that's probably been our biz- biggest uh, fluctuating cost is just water costs. And that's just from the renters just not telling us or just being negligent about yeah. using water or, not, or toilets that are running they don't tell us or something like that. Um, so that's definitely a, a big capital expense that we weren't expecting to have. Yeah, flappers and toilets are like the biggest culprit ever, and, and tenants never, mm-hmm. I mean, if they're not paying for water, they never make you aware that their toilet is running 24-7, and mm-hmm. the water bill gets racked up pretty darn quick. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it's also a strain on your septic system as well, you know, so like you know, your scenario there where you're on city water, but on septics, that, that is a major strain to your septics to have that much um, flow going through it. They're not, they're not designed to have 24 seven flow f- going through them. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they, right. they are to a certain extent, but not, not like someone turning the faucet on and is letting it run nonstop. You know, it's just, it's not, it's mm-hmm. not a good thing. Not a good thing. Um, cause the, the challenge that you run into with a septic like that, if you've got a lot of, uh, waste, you know, if you guys get heavy range for like a week straight and that ground's already saturated because, you know, 10 flappers are bad. The toilets are running 24 <laughs> seven, you know, that, that septic or that leach field necessarily can't do its job. If it gets a little bit of additional moisture on top of it, um, it has nowhere to go, it has nowhere to go. And so it struggles and, um, you run into challenges. So I want to talk to you about the business model itself. And uh, I've got some, you know, some of the negatives that I see with park owned homes. And again, this is just everyone's got their own way of running business. So there's no right or wrong way. And I don't want this show to be about, well, my way is better than your way because it's not. It's just different. It's just a different business model. But I want to kind of go through a few of the negatives that I see or that uh, I perceive are associated with park owned homes and having them in your park. And then I'd love to hear your feedback on each one of those challenges. Like, number one is uh, it's much more challenging to scale. And, you know, if your plan is to buy multiple mobile home parks, there's a certain point in time where it gets pretty overwhelming when you have 50, 70, 100, 150 park-owned home rentals. And so I'm not sure exactly where you plan to take your business, but do you see that becoming a challenge should you guys decide to keep growing your uh, your portfolio? Yeah, uh, to an extent, I do agree with you. Um, It would be difficult for me to manage and handle park-owned homes 
that weren't in my metro area. So for scaling outside of the San Antonio area, I don't know how feasible it would be to buy a park in uh, the eastern part of the United States. Uh, so, um, but it, right now, that's why I'm kind of just focused on the San Antonio area. Mm-hmm. And I know that limits me on the potential of mobile home parks and, you know, getting the best deals. Um, Cause a lot of the, there's obviously thousands of mobile home parks that aren't in the San Antonio area, but uh, for what we want to do right now, which is uh, cash flow, like we're mostly considered about getting our cash flow and then refinancing our parks. So we have zero money in the, in the game. That's kind of like where we are. If uh, we were to buy a park outside of San Antonio, we probably would want a uh, majority of them to be lot renters just right now. That's just not what we're looking for, but we might transition to, to something where majority of the homes are uh, tenant homes and stuff mm-hmm. and not park homes. And I'm assuming based on what you're renting those for, you would probably wouldn't have a hard time at all selling off the, the park on homes should you want to transition to that model in your, in your current parks, right? Do you agree with that? Right. There's, I agree 100%. There's a lot of people that want to buy them and just um, obviously the dent that it would take um, to our cash flow. So we're like, eh, not right now. Mm-hmm. But uh, we, we have sold maybe like a couple, like three or four um, in one of our other parks. But um, we just don't want to lose our, our cash flow. For, uh, just to, because we want to keep on having enough cash flow to make a big enough down payment uh, to buy more parks. But as we mm-hmm. grow and start having large chunks of cash or being able to find more investors to buy more parks, we might, uh, you know, just kind of go towards more, your model where it's mostly just the, the lot renters. Yeah, we still own a bunch of park owned homes. Unfortunately, we don't really like that, but uh, we own them just because we keep buying parks. And it seems like every park we buy has either a few or a lot <laughs> of park owned homes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're buying them faster than we are actually selling them off. But I mean, it's always our our, our goal to get in and, and sell them as fast as possible. Uh, some areas it works better than others to sell them off quickly, but, uh, but that, yeah, it's just the lot renter. We find, you know, one of the other things, well, let me, I'll mention one of the other negatives and, and it really kind of goes along with why we love the lot rental model. And that is, you know, with park on homes, you have a much higher turnover, you know, with a actual renter than a person that actually owns their own home is just renting the lot. In fact, a lot of our parks that have lot renters, you'll find that literally those people live there for 20 years, 25 years. I mean, like, they, and if they do sell, they just, they handle it internally. They sell it to a family member, sell it on the open market, and someone else moves in. Like, it literally just, it goes on without a blip. Like, nothing ever happens to our cash flow. It just continues to be steady. Um, we've only ever had to do one eviction on a um, on a lot renter, on someone that actually had their own home. They owned their own home. They were just paying lot rent. And um, typically, it never makes it to that. We've only had to do one. And we basically got that trailer back through an abandoned title process. And now we're essentially selling it, going to actually recap all of our money and probably even make a few thousand dollars profit on it, which isn't our preferred method. But, you know, the guy, he wasn't working with us. We wanted to buy the home from him before he truly fell into full default and uh, got evicted, but just couldn't work it out. But other than that, it's a very, very stable business model. And so um, do you see, and you might not be able to answer this question because you've only, um, you've been in park owner for about a year and a half, but do you see that you've had a lot of turnover in that year and a half period of time with the renters? Uh, yes and no, but um, if there, there is a vacancy, I get, if I put it on like Craigslist or, Loop, or on Zillow, like I'll probably get at least 10, 12, maybe even 20 interested people in that week. So uh, what we do is on something that's like 850 per month rent, we'll ask for 800 security deposit. So um, that $800 will cover the cost to get it, make ready and for another rent, uh, for another tenant to come in and rent the home. And uh, so I have another mobile home park. It's 27 or yeah, 27 spaces. And I'd say 90, 90% of them are, are uh, park owned and I have maybe one vacancy. It's just, um, it's not that hard to rent them out. Um, and we collect a big enough security deposit where it will cover hmm. the renovations and part of the, um, the, the rent for the next month. So it's just being able to be in a market where people want to live in the park or want to live in a mobile home that they're going to be renting and just be able to have that, People like the desirability of having a lot of people interested in that area. So just mm-hmm. the affordability um, factor. 
But don't you so, agree? At a certain point in time, that eight hundred dollars will not cover a make ready. Like that. That's a pretty light make ready. That's like wow. They actually did take half decent care of it. You know, you got to go in and do some touch up, carpet cleaning, maybe replace like a room or two of carpet. You know, some just very minor stuff. Um, but at, so, at a certain point in time, eight hundred dollars won't cover the typical make ready. Like where if someone lived there for two years and you know they might have had a pet or they had kids or anything like that. Would you agree with me on that? Because I very rarely do we ever have eight hundred dollar make readies on our park owned homes. But then again, we also don't we don't really skimp. Like if carpets got like stains in it, and you know, although we can clean most of them, like if it still seems kind of like grimy, um, we typically just replace it. You know, so I feel like we we go through a pretty lot. Of, we go through a lot of expenses as far as make readies are concerned. But then again, we don't defer anything. We kind of just we we do everything that always needs done every time there's a vacant unit. But do you foresee an, uh, an issue with that eight hundred dollars to where you'll actually there'll be a come you know come a point in time to where you're going to have a twenty five hundred dollar make ready, which is going to completely blow um, you know maybe profits for a period of time on that particular home. Right. So, um, so in order to get around the whole uh, carpet thing, we actually stripped out all the carpet and put linoleum down. So it's really easy just to clean that up with uh, just getting someone in there because we can get someone in there to clean a mobile home for a hundred bucks. Um, and then, uh, we have contractors that are, you know, um, on my business partner's salary job. So they're like $15 an hour plus materials. So that's why our make ready costs are super cheap, um, compared to maybe someone who doesn't have the contacts and the, the, the support that we have here locally. Gotcha. So you guys put linoleum uh, throughout but, the entire uh, trailer. Yep. Wow. Just like sheet linoleum. That's what we're talking about. Like roll, like roll linoleum. Yep, wow. roll linoleum or the, like the little, really cheap fifty nine cent like peeling sticks. <laughs> wow, wow. And that I mean that holds up for you know. Well, I guess again you're you'll find out in the next couple of years. But you know we did start. We started recently going with. Um, I used to use it in my apartments. Uh, you know years ago and it's now it's become very popular it wasn't all that popular back then but it's basically vinyl plank flooring but it's um yeah it's a 3m product it, they sell it at home depot it's called a lower flooring it's uh, it's kind of expensive like it's definitely uh you know more it's more than double the cost of like basic carpet or even basic linoleum um but it it looks like wood floor. It's really resilient. It's waterproof. There's no underlayment that has to go underneath it. I mean, it's, it's I forget, I think like five mil thick. And um, it just, it looks wonderful and it holds up really well. But the only way you can actually damage that stuff is if you had a dog that was literally scratching at one spot for like an hour straight, maybe they would actually, you know, get, get through it a little bit. Or if someone had a, you know, boiling hot like pan and the pan actually or like an iron or something like that and dropped it on it and let it sit there for a while like it probably actually melt a piece of it but you can easily replace like a strip of it and uh, so we've been actually going to that and again real expensive but now those units that are coming back around if they're park owned homes we're not necessarily having to do much to them you know just really just touch up paint and clean and and uh, they're ready to go again so right and then um the only time i've gotten over that amount was um we had to actually do an eviction on uh, it was like one of the first tenants I rented to, rented it to, and I didn't do that great of um, due diligence. I was just trying to fill it up, and they actually took the stove and the window units, so that was about a thousand dollars. But that was pretty much been the the most expensive uh, make ready, and that's just because of theft. Gotcha. Okay. Now, one of the other big negatives that I I foresee with um with with park with the park on model, and I know that you're going to debunk this because I know your answer because we talked about this last time we were on the phone is um. <laughs> You know, they're typically more challenging to get financed when you're buying the parks. You know, the banks, most of the time, I wouldn't say most of the time because Rich is going to prove me wrong on this, but most of the time, banks hate park-owned trailers. They don't like it. It's in their mind, if they even know anything about the, the mobile home park business, they know that they don't like the rental trailers and they really just want to lend on the actual improved land itself and the income that's generated by that. So talk to me about the financing side, because um, I believe that you've got a bank that seems to love this business <laughs> and is offering sure, yeah, great terms. It's, yeah, it's a, it's, yep. And it's a, it's a local bank here in San Antonio. So if, uh, if you have any mobile home parks in the San Antonio metro area, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I can give you that contact information. But uh, the 27 mobile home park um, in San Antonio, I bought it. Um, I first bought it owner finance and then I refied it. I bought it uh, for 450 with 100,000 down and then I put about another 100,000 into improvements, which included um, a brand new fence around the entire property and then leveling, skirting, 
and um, just getting the homes to a more um, quality look. Mm-hmm. Uh, because half the half the homes weren't even vacant, or they were vacant. So I think they only had like maybe ten out of the twenty seven were actual being lived in, and that's why it was such a great deal in my eyes. But uh, I refinanced it back in March, and uh, I was able to get around, I think it was like 700000 Uh So I was able to cash out, uh, get all my money out of the deal, and then get an extra like $120,000 to use on my next deal. So that's kind of like why I'm still going towards park-owned homes, just mm-hmm. because once I get the cash flowing and I get it uh, 100% full, and they will end up to 75% of the uh, appraised value. Uh, and it's uh, I think it's 25-year, 5%. But it's a five percent like floating or five year floating. So after five years, they'll reassess what the market is, and then it's called prime plus one. So whatever mm-hmm. I think the Fed, whatever their market, whatever the market interest rate is, they go up one percent above that, and then that's what your interest rate is going to be. Yep, yep. And so that park there, to twenty seven spaces, are all the lots filled with homes? Like you've got lots uh, or homes on every every single lot there? Yep. Every okay. single one, yep. So, I mean, just, and doing, they're all both for one. just doing quick math, and what's a lot rent in that area? Is it still 375? That one's, uh, yeah, 350. 350, okay. But just doing that quick math, you said you got a loan for 700,000. That still works, like based on just lot rent. Take 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 away the homes, take away the value of the homes, or even that rental income from the homes. That 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 purchase price, or that I guess that loan amount, the value that they put on it, the bank, that still definitely works at the 350 lot rent. If you're just looking at it from the lot rental standpoint, it's probably about a 10 cap, I would guess, somewhere right around there um, as far as an evaluation is concerned. So it sounds like uh, that one is uh, it's pretty much a home run, man. So you, you had a lot of work on the front end. You said you had 17 vacant park-owned homes. Is that correct? Right, yeah. Yeah, we probably put about about $1,500 per home, uh, not including some of them did need leveling. Uh, they're like, for whatever reason, these, so these homes are super older. <laughs> They're like 1970s. Okay. So, um, and uh, for whatever reason, when they brought in the homes, they didn't take the tiles or the the tires or the axles off. So, like the the homes were literally had the tires rotting into the ground, <laughs> and so it was making them very unstable, and they weren't um, leveled to the way they're supposed to. So we actually had to bring um, a toter in and um, actually re-level them and then reskirt them as well. So. We probably did those. Are probably about um, probably about five of the homes needed them pretty badly, and they're about uh, three thousand dollars to relevel them and rescrub them. So, yeah. But that was part of the hundred thousand that we used when we uh, know that knew that going in. Mm-hmm. But um, one thing you do need to watch when you're doing park owned homes is um, just like you were saying earlier about people taking a little bit better care of them if they own them is that um, for whatever reason, even though we put put in the park rules that they're not supposed to be throwing grease or anything down the toilet, that's not um, waste, but uh, we've noticed people throw down grease or they'll try to flush down things that aren't organic in nature. Mm-hmm. So we've had to we call the city out a couple of times and had them like flush out our system. So that that's been a challenge as well as um, um, septic issues. But it, luckily, it's city sewer, so it's not really bad. But uh, we've had to install like French drains and better better ways to re configure our sewer issues if that makes sense yeah no absolutely yeah Gr- grease is a um it's, it's not i guess that big of a deal if it's on city sewer i mean it still causes mm-hmm. issues and backups um you know because it, it just collects in the lines and it's like glue but right. the challenge really comes into play is when you have septics and um you know if you got that client base or that tenant base that cooks with a lot of grease depending on their their uh you know their nationality like some some uh you know nationalities use more grease in their cooking than others uh they pour that down the drain that's literally like your leach field the water needs to basically or the you know the the gray water needs to be able to seep out into the soil but if it's got grease going out there as well um you're literally going to clog up the holes in the pipes and um your leach field is not going to be effective anymore i mean it's it's essentially going to kill it pretty quickly if they're pouring it down the drain so not a good thing whatsoever um 
And so I want to better understand your management system there in your park. So you have basically what you call a a shower or, you know, someone that's in the park that's um, basically going to be the person that just literally opens up the door, hands over the the application, um, you know, is going to sign the lease when that time comes. But other than that, do they have any other responsibilities? I mean, are they collecting rents? Are they following evictions? Um, are they taking, you know, any of the leasing calls at all? Like when there's an available unit, can you give me an idea of what that on-site person does? Right. So, yeah, pretty much they are just going to be opening the door, like you said, and showing it to them and then give them the rental application. And then they'll give them the lease agreement as well, have them fill it out, and then I'll go collect it. Um, And then we actually have a collections lady. Uh, So the ways that we either collect rents is through uh, they deposit into our Chase checking account. They just put on the deposit slip what, what, what park they're in and what number home they are. So when they deposit in, it in there, we can go into our, our like, we'll go online to Chase.com and then it will pop up on the little feed as who, who deposited it and what number so we know who to credit it to. Uh, or we'll do ACH payments or we'll just do by mail. We don't have, like, a box out there because we don't want to have someone say, oh, I put it in there and then magically <coughs> disappeared. So yeah, uh, we, we don't like to do collection boxes at the park. Okay. Are you guys, um, are you pretty black and white with your, um, with when your rents do and when you guys actually go into filing evictions? Yeah. Um, well, usually if, uh, if they're over 30 days, then we'll start the eviction process. I know a lot of people do it a lot quicker than that, but, um, usually if it's 30 days late, then we'll, we'll do the eviction. We never, out of all our homes, we never actually have to come to court. Usually, uh, once we put that three notice to vacate, uh, usually they're, they're out. So, and then, like I was saying, like we collected the, um, the security deposit, which pretty much at least covers the make ready costs. We might be out, you know, one month's rent, but that's, I guess, just part of doing business and one of the negatives to park on homes. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about, um, what's in the future. What, what does the future hold for you guys? Are you guys actively looking at other deals and pursuing them at this point in time? Oh yeah, absolutely. So we just bought another park. It's a 35 space park with, a uh, two, uh, two bedroom single family house on there as well. Uh, it's six acres. And we bought that one. It's in Poteet, Texas, which is about 20 minutes South of San Antonio. That one was a pretty much, it was a uh, foreclosed and, uh, looked like pretty much like a landfill. So we had to, they had like some mobile homes there that, but, but you can pretty much like literally see through them entirely. Like they were like just oh my gosh. garbage. Yeah, it was, so, um, it was definitely a task. We're still working on it. Uh, we're about 80% done on that. We're just waiting to get the rest of the, uh, meters cause they stole the meter loops as well. So we had to get new meter loops and meters and all the electrical and the mobile homes that were there in, in the single family house was ripped and stripped and all that stuff. So we are, we're working on that one right now to get it all in shape. And that one, I bought that one for, that one was a uh, 225,000 and it was a uh, $25,000 down. Um, so our rent payments like 1600 a month or our, our mortgage is 1600 a month with the taxes. And, uh, we have about 17 people living there now. And, uh, pretty much we have all the spaces full except for four. Um, cause what we did, we partnered with a person who left a big, uh, name, um, manufacturer or a dealer. And so he started his own dealer, D dealer, dealer, like new mobile home dealer. Mm-hmm. So we let him move his dealer into our mobile home park. So he has an office there that he pays lot rent on. And then in the first eight spots, he brought in all new mobile homes. Wow. In the front. So all of those are for sale and she makes the park look fuller. And then the rest of the 24 spots, we have anywhere from eighties and nineties and two thousands mobile homes, uh, that we have pretty much filled. Are they so not- we used, um, I was going to ask, is that retailer, are they paying you a lot rent on all those eight homes, uh, the new homes they have sitting there? Uh, no, it's kind of like the agreement. He's just going to pay the lot rent on the um, on the office that he has there. But uh, the agreement was that he'll keep those uh, mobile homes, the new ones there, and we'll sell them and not move them. Uh, so we pretty much get to keep those new mobile homes there. Plus, it's more aesthetically looking. Absolutely. But uh, we're, not getting, we're not collecting uh, lot rents on the on the vacant ones that are in the front until they get sold. What kind of interest have you had on the new ones? Do you know, I mean, has he sold any of them yet? The ones that are sitting there? Uh, he sold them, but not the ones that are there in the park there. They okay. haven't been sold yet. Okay. But uh, the ones that we brought in that are used that are like your, like 1990s and 2000s, we've 
sold those, um, usually uh, owner financed. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. And I do have some videos that uh, if you had like a, a show note or something like that, I could share with you. Some yeah, of my, uh, that'd be great. Videos I made kind of like every month I made videos of the progress of how things have gone. So it's a drastic change. Yeah, I'd love I'd love to put those up in the show notes, Scott. I wish I any I needed we need to do with our parks. I feel like we take we take photos when we uh, when we purchase it, but very rarely do other than like a manager drive through. Do we take um, uh, photos as we progress forward with like the major renovation? And we typically have them when we're done, but um, we need to get more proactive about doing it. Like you know during the process itself. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really good for attracting investors and also yeah, showing absolutely. it to the bank, showing like, wow, look at what we did. This is absolutely nothing to you know, a fully running 100% occupied park. And this is, this is the amount of work that it took and this is how much it costs. And I think banks really like that. And they like to see like that shows your level of skill and uh, your commitment, your, your level of commitment to making a project work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I've got one other question I want to ask you, Rich, before we wrap things up for the day. I know you work a full-time job. Um, and so there's a lot of people that are looking to get into this niche, but they, they think that, you know, well, I mean, I'm not going to really have the time. Like, I work a full time job, and um, how how the heck am I going to manage a property, uh, especially one that's got like ten or twenty or thirty units in it and, and needs renovations while working this full time job? So, um, do you want to kind of um, you know step on that myth and debunk it a little bit that you know it definitely it is possible it is possible to get into this niche um, and still work a full time job and maintain both? I mean, would you agree with that statement? Yeah, absolutely. It's just um, being able to delegate uh, work, and you may so you may have to give up some of your um, income to people to help you run it. So, if you uh, if you're young and you say you're going to college and you're working, like me, me, just you know, find people who are going to college and they want to make ten dollars an hour, and maybe pay them their mileage just to show the homes, or um, just getting people, meeting people in the area that maybe own mobile home parks and see if you can use their construction guys to work on things just uh being able to delegate um the things that you're not able to handle just because now we're at the 70 pads i can't you know if someone calls me and they're interested in mobile home well i can't show it and also try to grow the business so i try to like we were saying earlier i try to give out the things that i don't like and focus on the things which i do like what Mm -hmm. i like to do is like i like finding parts doing the due diligence uh, marketing meeting up with other mobile home park um investors and, and the growth and the marketing and the advertising of the business. Mm-hmm. So that's what I focus on. And then my other business partner, he focuses on the transport, the make readies, the repairs, the uh, collections. And then, um, so it just, it's a win-win for both of us. Just see if you can maybe find someone that's kind of like that as well. Just where your weaknesses are, maybe find someone that has that strength. Yep, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the whole idea behind it, like a strategic partnership. I mean, our real estate investment group, the other partners, you know, Charles is one of them. We've got another uh, partner as well in our company. And uh, I mean, we all have complementary strengths to one another. And uh, you know, it doesn't work unless you have that type of partnership. But you, you definitely can um, do this business while working a full-time job. I actually, I know a guy that, I'm not going to mention his name, but I know a guy that owns, uh, gosh, he owns 600 spaces, 700 spaces, and he still works a full-time job. I mean, a pretty demanding full-time job in sales. He travels a ton, and uh, but he's got a... Uh, a strategic partner involved and they kind of share skill sets or the complementary skill sets there and uh, it allows him to essentially have a very large portfolio but still maintain his job. He actually loves his job so he really didn't have an intent of, of leaving his job um, at any point in time and so um, and so it's, it's definitely possible. Anything's possible and uh, yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us Rich and um, any last any last like final thoughts that you might have for someone that's considering getting into this niche? I would say just um, either uh, get educated um, on kind of what you need to do to get into the space and make sure you don't end up with a, a junk deal because there's nothing worse than getting your first deal and it's burning a hole in your pocket. So just getting educated or, um, you know, if, if you have the time, you don't have the money, maybe partner with someone who has the money, uh, uh, whether that's, you know, Kevin or someone here locally, someone locally in your area. And um, make sure you run your numbers right when you're buying a property. And um, but, and like I said before, like um, Kevin, you've got a lot of great uh, free tutorials and videos that you have. And I really liked your um, academy uh, as far as being able to have that um, 100% money back guarantee. Because so uh, prior to getting into the mobile home park businesses, uh, I paid like five grand for a single family 
um, rental business, which I know that you were into prior to in the mobile home park space. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, it was like they cherry picked their deals cause they were saying, Oh yeah, $5,000 out of pocket and you can cash flow two fifty. But after I joined, I paid the money of their, those very few that had the 5,000 out of pocket with the two fifty cash flow. And right. I wasn't going to get that. So I felt like I was kind of cheated. Yeah. So I really like your whole pr program where you have a, a guarantee that backs your, your process and your, in your program. So, yeah, uh, I tell you, if, if you're looking it. at any programs out there, if it doesn't have some kind of guarantee, like a money back guarantee, where if, if it doesn't work for you in a certain period of time, then uh, be skeptical. You know, be skeptical because yeah. anyone that's offering coaching or training or mentorship should be willing to um, back up their product and guarantee it for a certain period of time. And uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Rich, this has been a lot and of fun. So, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, to interrupt you. Which? Oh no, I was going to say yeah. Even if uh, partner with someone, if you have the cash, and maybe just give half the half the profit to someone that's definitely worth just Absolutely. the experience just get the experience in your belt because once you get the experience people are going to start reaching out to you and people are kind of think that you're the you know the subject matter expert in your field and you'll, you'll be amazed by how many i've get people that message me all the time and i feel like i'm i'm still pretty green i feel at this even though i run three parks i'm not an expert but uh i'm just keep on continually learning and mm -hmm. refining my processes Yep. Well, that's great, Rich. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. Really appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, guys, that, that's all we have for today's episode. But uh, before Rich and I say goodbye, just want to remind you of the free gift that Charles and I offer to uh, to all of you that take the time to go over to iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. And that gift that we'll give you is the cold call script that we use in our very own business. And um, we buy uh, parks primarily through off-market means of direct mail or cold calling. And so we've, we've got a lot of parks in our portfolio that were basically acquired um, by making a cold call. And so we will give you the exact same cold calling script that we use in our very own business. And here's how you're going to redeem that, that gift from us. Just after you submit your review on iTunes, just go ahead and send us an email to gift at mobilehomeparkacademy.com. Just tell us who you are and what screen name that you used to leave that review, and we'll go ahead and send you that free gift. And uh, also be sure to stop by our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com. You can listen to all of our previous podcast shows, as well as get a free copy of our popular ebook, which is called The 21 Biggest Mistakes Investors Make When Purchasing Their First Mobile Home Park and How to Avoid Them. And, uh, you know, there's, as Rich has mentioned, there's a lots, of, lots of potential mistakes you can make in this niche. Uh, it's very different from any other type of real estate investment out there, um, especially when it comes to the infrastructure of the, a lot of these parks. And so you definitely want to grab a copy of that book, uh, 21 Biggest Mistakes, because we go through a lot of the big ones that could literally be catastrophic if you purchased the wrong park. If you made a mistake and didn't do your inspections properly, um, there's lots of lemons out there. And I'm sure Rich could probably agree with me that uh, there's lots of lemons and you just you don't want to be the guy that buys that lemon, right? Because it's, it's really hard to get out of exactly. once you're in it. <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, other than that, guys, I uh, really appreciate you stopping by and joining us here at the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. And uh, this is Kevin Bupp signing off. Congratulations for taking the necessary steps to achieving massive success through the highly lucrative niche of mobile home park investing. Be sure to visit our website, mobilehomeparkacademy.com, to download your free digital ebook version of the 21 biggest mistakes investors make when buying their first mobile home park and how you can avoid them. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to our free monthly mobile home park investing newsletter, which is jammed full of valuable tips, tricks, and strategies to help you accelerate your path to success as a mobile home park investor. More information about this podcast and its hosts can be found by visiting mobilehomeparkacademy.com.